Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second week of the Online Language Pedagogy Series 2019, Selecting and Adapting Materials for Online Language Learning and Teaching. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Booten, and I am happy to serve as your series facilitator. And today's sessions, we'll have selecting and adapting online materials for the interpretive mode of communication and selecting and adapting online materials for the interpersonal mode of communications. Remember, we will have a brief survey at the end of both of our presentations today, so we ask that you take a moment to complete the survey. And the TED Ed lessons are also available for the topics we discussed last week, if you haven't had a chance to review and leave your thoughts on that, especially if you're planning on earning the digital badge. So today to talk with us on the topic of selecting and adapting online materials for the interpretive mode of communication, we have Jesse Gleason. Jesse is an assistant professor at the Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut, where she coordinates the World Language Secondary Teacher Certification programs in French, German, Italian, and Spanish, as well as the lower division Spanish program. Her teaching and research interests include teacher education, biliteracy development, and computer-assisted language learning, also known as CALL. She has also recently published in a special issue of the Calico Journal, an article about social justice and CALL. Jesse and her husband are raising their children to be bilingual. She also enjoys yoga, hiking, and traveling with her family to South America. Jesse, welcome. We're very happy to have you with us. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, I will be focusing on, as Sarah said, on the interpretive mode. And we're going to dive right in because that was such a great introduction. All right, so today's goals are the following you're going to identify key components of the interpretive mode and interpretive tasks with respect to proficiency levels. You're going to be able to select multimodal texts for interpretive tasks based on multimodal genres. And we'll talk a little bit more about what, what that means, multimodality and different genres. And you'll be able to design uh, interpretive tasks and assessments using the teaching learning cycle and backwards design. Okay, to start us out, we're going to um, just think about a couple of things and feel free to jot down the notes in the chat box. Um, you'll have about, I said five minutes for this, but I think that's probably going to be too much. So let's say two minutes. Uh, I'll start the timer down here. And when we get to two minutes, I'll, I'll bring us back together. So I want you to think about um, and write two things. First of all, what's one idea that you have about how to create tasks for the interpretive mode? And what is one question that you have about how to assess student performance in the interpretive mode? All right, so I'll just give you, again, two minutes to think about this and write it down. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. I've been keeping uh, a little bit of an eye. I couldn't read all of your, your comments, but um, I see that you have some great ideas. And um, I actually had to, to, to back up a step, a step. I noticed that Shiva, you said, well, could you explain a little bit more what is the interpretive mode? So thank you, Shiva, for that question, because it's true. We haven't really even defined what that means. So we're going to take a step back and do exactly that. We're going to talk about what is the interpretive mode. So. Um, the interpretive mode of communication comes from the World Readiness Standards for Language Learning. And um, you'll see standard 1.2 states that students understand and interpret written and spoken language on a variety of topics. 
right? So we're talking about written and spoken language and different topics, basically. Okay, and here this slide explains a little bit more about the interpretive mode as it is accompanied by the interpersonal and the presentational modes. And you can see the source for this comes from Actful. And um, so interpretive mode of communication, you're basically looking at, you're interpreting, or students rather, are interpreting what the author, speaker, or producer wants the receiver of the message to understand. It's one-way communication, right? That means that your students won't have recourse to the active negotiation of meaning um, like they might in, or they would have in the interpersonal mode. I wanted to highlight um, this next one here. So interpretation differs from comprehension and translation in that interpretation implies the ability to read or listen between the lines. Um, and finally, the reading and the listening and the viewing includes, and I, I know that a, a number of you mentioned this in the chat box just a second ago, this use of authentic materials, whether they be websites, stories, articles, speeches, messages, songs, or video clips. Okay, so that's really what we mean by the interpretive mode of communication. And um, I'm going to ask for a poll to be pulled up here um, and just to gauge your familiarity with um, this assessment. It's called the APPLE, um, which stands for the Actful Assessment of Performance Toward Proficiency in Languages. How, how many of you are familiar with this? Um, if you could just please rate your familiarity with the concept of the apple. Are you strongly familiar with it? Familiar means you've heard of it, but you don't know that much maybe. Unfamiliar, you've, you've not heard of it, or you've heard of it, but maybe you, you know nothing else except for the name. And then strongly unfamiliar, just um, you've never even heard of it. So just go ahead and please rate your familiarity with the concept of the Apple assessment. Okay, great. So I see that um, about 40% of you are familiar with the Apple, so that's great. Uh, almost 40 are unfamiliar with it. So we're going to take a moment and sort of um, unpack, not really go into too much depth with this, but um, so as I said, the Apple test is um, it's put out by Actful. It's a proficiency-driven assessment. So this, um, what I like about it is that uh, it is uh, based, on stand, based on the five Cs or the standards. And this uh, content prompt actually shows from 2017, um, those of you who are working with um, students in grades six or under, you can see that, for example, your students would be for reading, they would be reading texts on this assessment that describe the school's floor plan, uh, chores that they do, and someone's hobbies. Okay, so you know this is what's going to be the topic of the test, and your novice learners are going to be reading that, right? But then the actual task, we don't know, right? The Apple, they give us the topics, but they obviously cannot give us the actual test tasks. So we might imagine that an appropriate task for the novice learner would be that they would read, for example, about chores, and then they make a list of those chores, right? Another example from interpretive listening would be that they, your students would listen to someone talking. Now this is at the intermediate level, um, talking about a house, or tips from their teacher on stargazing, that sounds interesting, uh, and rules of the language classroom, right? And so those are the, the listening prompts that they would be hearing. And in terms of a task, we might imagine that they would be filling out a Venn diagram about how their house is similar and different 
to um, the house that's mentioned in the listening passage. Okay, so let's see, just um, these are for learners grade six and below. Let's look at the content topics for the teachers in the grade seven and above. Right, so for um, advanced students, they might be listening to someone talking about life around Chernobyl. Um, you, you can notice that the topics, the content is more complex for learners at, in the upper grades. Um, they might be um, listening about books that work as subway tickets, or they might listen to an astronaut uh, keeping fit in space, right? A imaginary task would be that they're summarizing the main points of, say, uh, someone's life around Chernobyl, okay? And then here's just a, another example from the interpretive reading. So advanced students in the upper grades reading about texts, uh, reading texts about a child who boarded a plane and traveled alone. Ooh, about an octopus who escaped his aquarium. That sounds interesting. And about a record-breaking international swim. Okay, so if they do this, we might imagine that they are going to have to draw a conclusion based upon the article. Okay, so um, I like the apple because it gives teachers a sense of what their students are going to be um, assessed, how they're going to be assessed at the end of the semester or end of the school year. And then it has ideally positive wash back into your classroom so that you know um, that you can do similar types of things in the classroom to then get them prepared for this uh, proficiency assessment. Okay, so I know we're talking about assessment, but we're going to come back to that in the end. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the interpretive mode and tasks that you are going to be, or maybe um, you're already doing them, but you're going to refine them a little bit. Um, so these, what you can see here are the proficiency benchmarks. These are, these are put out by NCSSFL and ACTFL. They're the can-do statements. So I'd like you to take another poll, which is going to ask for your familiarity with the can-do statements. Again, you're going to be um, rating yourself in terms of are you strongly familiar, familiar, unfamiliar, or strongly unfamiliar with the can-do statements. Okay, great. So the majority of us are familiar, about 60%, um, about 25% are unfamiliar, and 18, almost 20% are strongly familiar. Okay, so for those of you who are strongly familiar, this is going to be a bit of a review, um, but hopefully you'll be able to, to get something out of this and then lend us your expertise in the final Q&A with this. So, Let's look at what the proficiency benchmarks say for the interpretive mode. Now, what's nice about this is we can, we can see clearly about um, interpretive communication, what students are going to be able to do, right? So at the novice level, they're able to identify the general topic and basic information in, most, in both very familiar and everyday contexts. Right? They're recognizing memorized words, phrases, and simple sentences in spoken, written, and signed texts. Okay, if we jump over to the intermediate learners, they are able to understand the main idea and some pieces of information on familiar topics um, from sentences and series of connected sentences within those three types of texts. And then our advanced learners are understanding the main message and supporting details on a wide variety of familiar and general interest topics across time frames from complex organized texts. All right, so with that in mind, we're gonna look a little bit more, we're gonna unpack um, because how the can-do statements are organized is that first you have the benchmarks, which we just saw, and then we have these performance indicators. Okay, and so for interpretive communication, we have three main questions, which is, I love these questions because they really get down to uh, the types of texts 
that learners are exposed to or that you are providing them. The first type is the informational texts, right? So the main question there is what can I understand, interpret or analyze in authentic informational texts? And then same question, but in fictional texts. And then again, the same question for conversations and discussions. So we might tend to think of the first two informational and fictional texts as primarily written language, whereas the conversations and discussions are more spoken or oral language. Okay, which we'll come back to. I want to focus in on the informational texts because I know that there's a lot of sort of uh, little language in here, but just to give you a sense, the performance indicator for novice mid says, I can identify some basic facts from memorized words and phrases when they are supported by gestures or visuals and informational texts. Okay, so we're gonna compare that a learner at novice mid to a learner at intermediate high who can usually follow the main message in various time frames in straightforward and sometimes descriptive para paragraph length informational text. And then we'll compare that to our advanced mid speaker who can understand the underlying message and most supporting details across major time frames in descriptive informational texts. Okay, so it gives us a, a really sort of clear picture of what learners are able to do with regard to understanding, interpreting, and analyzing informational texts across ability levels. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for a second. Um, I've been, I'm sure, throwing this word input around. Um, and input is, a, it's, it's the key word for the interpretive mode because like many of you were saying in the chat box before, we depend on this idea of authentic texts, spoken, written, or um, viewable videos. Um, by members of a language and culture for members of the same language and cultural group, right? So when we're talking about authentic input, we're really talking about um, texts that were created by native speakers for native speakers and um, not texts that were created with pedagogical purposes in mind. Okay, so I have to give a shout out to my uh, colleague here in Connecticut, Leah Grainer Kennedy, um, who has given us these examples of real world input in a reading environment, right? So we're talking about written language and there's so much out there nowadays, right? So you can just see here, um, numerous examples, right? You can use in terms of written text, you can use schedules, advertisements, menus, um, catalogs, cartoons, emails, instructions, newspapers, magazines, poetry, short stories, plays, novels, and internet sites, right? I tend to use a ton of internet sites just because of the ease and accessibility of these, right? And here we can see some real world listening types of texts. We have announcements, recorded voice messages, music, right? I bet um, many of you use music from your target language culture. This is so great, especially with learners in elementary and um, secondary context, but really with everyone. Um, talk shows, TV programs, lectures, performances, movies, right, short films too, radio, podcasts, huge availability of podcasts nowadays, plays, conversations, debates, instructions, and sports play-by-plays. Okay, and then finally for real-world context viewing, we have models, charts, graphs, graphic organizers, maps, 
right? Subway map here of, I think it's Beijing subway map. Um, posters, uh, pictures, infographics. One of my favorite are the infographics. We'll be coming back to those in a little bit. Photos, movies, signs, symbols, painting, sculptures, architecture, and schedules. Okay, so thank you, Leah, for these numerous examples of input and authentic text. Um, because these really form the basis of selecting online materials for the interpretive mode, which is the topic, right? So <clears throat> I told you earlier that we are going to, that we were going to define what is meant by multimodal texts, right? And nowadays in our 21st century digital students, they, I would say, are most accustomed to multimodal text, which is just a fancy word for saying texts that combine two or more semiotic systems, right? Semiotic meaning-making meaning -making systems, right? So they combine li linguistic and visual, right? Audio, gestural, spatial. And you can see on this graphic, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, just many um, different types of multimodal texts, right? Posters, videos, screencasts, um, newscasts, comics, all great examples. Okay, so we're gonna be focusing in on three types of multimodal texts, um, memes, right? Infographics, and then news articles in online um, periodicals. Okay, I'm gonna have uh, us pull up another poll here. Um, no, actually, the poll's not gonna work with this one. Sorry, never mind. Um, so you're just going to write in the chat box maybe whether you think this is an authentic text here shown on the left hand side based on our definition of authentic text that we were just um, using. So I'm going to argue that using our definition of authentic text, which is a text created by native speakers for native speakers, that this may be not authentic, right? I know you could probably argue that in some cases it is. But for our purposes, we're going to say this is not authentic. Um, and I'm going to give you another example of a text for novice learners that might be somewhat more authentic. So this idea of the meme, or in Spanish, we say the meme. So um, here's a few examples of memes that I've just pulled up. Um, in relation to our topic or our theme, which is food, okay? And these three memes are all talking about um, actually vegetarianism or veganism, um, which is sort of a subtopic within the domain of food. And the first one I'll just sort of translate for you because not everybody speaks Spanish. So, um, this one says, if you love animals, the, sorry, the furthest one on the left says, if you love animals, don't eat them and don't, ex uh, don't exploit them or use them, okay? So we might say that this is an example of a multimodal text just because we have a little bit of a graphic there. We have a link to a Facebook, whoops, down at the bottom, and in addition to the text, right? The second one, the one in the middle says veganism uh, is the extension, the logical extension of the philosophy of nonviolence said by Dexter Scott King, the son of Martin Luther King Jr. who has been an activist and vegan since 1988. And then the furthest to the right, another meme says, hi, I'm a chicken, I'm a pig and I'm a dog and none of us want to be your dinner, okay? So let's look at, um, we're going to be coming back to the meme in a second, but let's, I'll just ask you again to answer the same question. Is this using our definition 
an authentic text. Ask you to ring in in the chat box. Okay, most of you are saying no, nope. Okay, great. So, right, I don't think it's as authentic as it could be, right? Let's look at an alternative which is this idea of the infographic. Okay, so there's a number of love infographics. I'm sure many of you use infographics uh, as well. Uh, tons of them out there nowadays, right, with Pinterest and some of these other sites where you can actually uh, create your own infographic, but all of these were taken from um, Spanish-speaking websites. Right, and the topic is the home or the house. Um, so we won't go through all of these in too much depth, but um, let's just look at the one on the furthest left-hand side. It's talking about the ideal house, okay? So this is talking about um, how to really evaluate or select the ideal house, some questions that one should ask themselves, the zone of the house and then down here at the bottom uh, some statistics for example 15,000 new families need a house each year and i believe this was taken from the architectural an architectural website in nicaragua okay so the infographic uh, we're going to come back to that too but before that i'll just ask you this question one last time um, what you see on the left hand side there, would you consider it to be an authentic text or would these be authentic texts? These are um, a, a draft of a letter and then a final pen pal letter. So I guess um, somebody brought up this issue too, which I might address here. Um, Tourette says, uh, a text can be put to authentic or inauthentic purposes according to the def definition of authenticity. That's true, but we're defining it as a, a text written by a native speaker for a native speaker. So in this sense, uh, with using that definition, we're gonna say it's not an authentic text, but um, definitely more advanced than the meme or the infographic. So for your advanced learners, uh, a multimodal text that uh, would be a, a great choice would be an online news article, right? This one comes from Emol, the, the online Mercurio newspaper, which is one of the most popular newspapers in Santiago de Chile. And um, in addition to the article, right, and the multimodality that you can see within this online text is the comment at the end, which are sometimes even more entertaining to read than the article itself. Okay, so the online news article, also a good choice for uh, selecting um, authentic text. And with that, um, I wanna look at some of the features of our multimodal texts, right? So the meme, um, let's go back to this meme by Dexter Scott King. In this case, uh, you can see some features of the multimodal text, right? For example, we have an image, the visual, and we have a short text. In this case, it's a quote. Okay, so some features of multimodal meme. How about the features of our multimodal infographic, the Casa Ideal? Right, we can see that there are more images, more multimodality in the infographic, a lot more is going on, and there are longer chunks of text to accompany the images. Okay, and then for the features of our online news article, we have the title, the byline, and an image, right? These are just some features, right? We could analyze the news article more in depth, certainly, um, but we won't for purposes of time in this particular space. 
Okay, and we're going to come back to this idea of selecting and adapting online materials. So the rule of thumb, again, this is from my colleague Le Leah Grainer Kennedy um, here in Connecticut, and she comes up with this idea, rule of thumb for selecting multimodal texts. First of all, you're going to Look for texts, obviously, that address the topic of the unit, right? This might seem kind of obvious. However, when you see number two, it won't be so obvious, right? So you're not going to select texts that have specific vocabulary or grammar structures, right? Which is how many of us for many years used to go about looking for texts. Right, we, we were looking for texts because our syllabi were language um, and grammar driven syllabi. So we were looking, uh, looking for texts that had examples of the subjunctive or preterite versus imperfect, right? I'm just drawing on examples from Spanish because that's the context I know best, but you can imagine for the languages that you teach. Um, so again, two rules of thumb, they go hand in hand looking for texts that address the topic of the unit, whether it's food or um, housing uh, or the city, um, rather than the, the grammar structures. Okay, and some suggestions for um, selecting and, and finding um, authentic input. First of all, you're going to Google, it might seem obvious to you're going to Google in the target language, not just the topic, but also the genre. Right. So if I'm looking for memes about, in this case, global warming, I'm going to put the genre meme followed by the topic global warming. Right. And that brings up a whole bunch of uh, examples of um, authentic input. Okay, so that's the first one. The second suggestion here is to Google target language images for novice learners, right? I'm sure many of you are doing this, but the images feature in Google is great for getting exactly what you want. I'm sure many of you are on Twitter as well. You can use the hashtag to search the topic. In this case, uh, the environment pulls up a whole bunch of options for authentic resources. Pinterest, who all here loves Pinterest and uses Pinterest? Um, this is a, a great resource for language teachers. This comes from a, a Pinterest page from a colleague of mine here in Connecticut. Uh, her name is Amanda Redmond Arcon. She's a teacher, high school teacher here. And she's got her Pinterest page um, all organized according to topic, right? So she has health, um, work, uh, vegan recipes, wellness, and she's got tons of images and infographics in there. So definitely follow her. Um, and Pinterest, I'm sure there are many, many more um, great, uh, great folks on Pinterest that you can follow as well. All right, other great, um, we talked a little bit about songs or music. This uh, comes from my, my uh, student and my former student and teacher here, Brooke Biolo who has graciously allowed us to look at her um, video playlist for her Spanish middle school class. She has, you can see, um, organized this by artist, song title, and in her notes, you can see if a video is okay or not. Always good to preview the videos before watching them. Okay, here's an example um, of news, right? So you can, um, if you're doing news articles, especially with your higher level learners, um, a suggestion that I have for you is to visit the target language speaking newspapers 
right? Visit the actual newspaper like El Mercurio or in this case, El País from Uruguay, right? And if you're um, looking for a resource for finding, you know, the different news national newspapers from different countries, you can have a look at this Prensa Escrita. Again, this is for Spanish, but I'm sure that um, there are other lists similar to this for the other languages. And you can see um, just a list of newspapers according to country. So there's Spain, Mexico, Argentina, and all of these other Spanish speaking countries right there on Prensa Escrita. Okay, and then the final uh, suggestion would be, um, you know, the another infographic essentially, which is the weather comparing and contrasting in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina with New Haven, Connecticut, right? There's so much that you can do with this type of multimodal text, looking at words like humedad, condensación, presión, visibilidad, right? These are, um, academic vocabulary items from the content area of science. So you are making those connections to the other disciplines. And you can also make connections with, for example, comparing um, metric to Fahrenheit and um, many others there. So compare and contrast using weather. All right. So this brings us to another um, sort of task that I'm going to ask you all to think about. Um, so with regards to interpretive communication, consider a resource that you are using. Okay, the resource can be a textbook that you're using, right, that's sort of uh, more general or a particular, you can get very specific, like a particular infographic that you're using. How do learners demonstrate their understanding of those texts other than translating? Okay, so that's the first question. And the second, what are some before, during, and after listening, reading, viewing activities that help improve understanding? Okay, so again, the countdown is for five minutes, but we're gonna, for reasons of time, um, stop at about two minutes and feel free to type your ideas into the chat box. All right, so thank you everyone for sharing your ideas. Um, we're gonna go into a little bit more depth now with this idea of how learners can demonstrate their understanding and what are some activities that you can do to help improve that. Okay, so we're going to go into two examples. Um, the first is using genre theory. And um, genre theory is kind of a fancy name, but it also um, incorporates a, this idea that we all already know about, which is this I do, we do, you do, or this gradual release of responsibility, right? And this model comes from the Fisher and Frey model, also from Star Talk. Okay, so this idea that the teacher demonstrates and models in the beginning of the unit, right, much more um, teacher led, and then gradually begins to let go of the control um, with the sharing, the guiding, and then the applying, you, uh, the teacher monitors and provides feedback, but really is much less, more of a guide on the side for the, the applying activity exercises. Okay, so genre theory, um, or otherwise known as the teaching learning cycle, the TLC, is the same idea of gradual release, but it focuses around a central genre. So we've been talking about three genres, um, the meme, the infographic, and the online news article. So you're starting with the genre. Um, you're looking at its features. And then you're explicitly teaching students those features. That's what they call the deconstruction phase. Okay, so this building the context or the field is the first, it's the most teacher led. Um, you're right doing these pre uh, viewing or pre reading activities with them to activate their background knowledge on the topic. And then 
you're modeling the text, you're showing them examples of a, a good example of the text. And then you're, you're doing this, the we do portion, which is guided practice. Maybe you're creating a, a, a meme together. And then finally, the independent construction phase where they are set off on their own to create their own um, product, right? So this, the TLC, otherwise known as genre pedagogy, and I'm gonna take you through uh, a, an example of this using, um, here at Southern Connecticut State, we're very focused and committed to, to the theme of social justice. And so uh, for a second semester Spanish class, um, we used this idea of the TLC and students uh, were creating their own meme based upon a social justice theme that was interesting or important for them. Okay, so we followed these four steps that we just talked about and I'll give you an example of each of these. So step one was building the context and um, so we watched a video. This wasn't the obviously the focal genre. This was a video that illustrated a social justice topic. Students then um, with this project had to uh, eventually create their own memes and share them at the social justice week. They created their memes using the standards for social justice. That which have four main topics, identity, diversity, justice, and action. And then um, you can see this video, oops, I'll play it, we can't hear it, um, but you can see that this video has a little girl who uh, is faced with the topic of bullying, essentially. And you can see in the video that she uh, is, a little bit bullied by these girls in her class or um, other, other people, but she decides to be herself. And that's what the video is. So yo, I am myself, okay? So some pre, um, some activities for building the context were, were watching this video and talking about what happened to the little girl, what's her personality like, and then what, what do some of these things mean? Um, from the actual song, which we followed along to. Okay, step two was modeling the text or the genre, right? So we saw a number of memes that were focused on bullying, right? And we looked at the features of the meme, the image and the short text. Step three was guided practice. So we all chose, we used this infograph or this, um, the, this table rather, this key visual to um, look at the meme, choose a meme, try and connect it to a social justice standard, try and pick out some of the key words and then describe it, okay? And then the final product you can see here, some of their excellent independently constructed memes, which I was really impressed with, you know, a second semester uh, Spanish class to be able to create these big ideas um, in their memes, are all related to social justice. Okay, so this is just one example. Um, a second example using backward design and before we um, progress, I'd like to pull up the last poll, I think, which is going to ask, uh, how familiar are you with backward design or otherwise known as understanding by design? Are you strongly familiar with it? Are you familiar? Are you unfamiliar or strongly unfamiliar? Go ahead and, and rate yourself. All right. So, Majority is familiar or strongly familiar, but an, a, a fair percentage, about 30%, about a third are, are not. So let's go into this just a little bit. So understanding by design or backward design, as the name alludes, is you're starting with the end, right? You're starting with your desired results. You're determining what is acceptable evidence 
And then you're planning your learning experiences and instruction based upon that roadmap, okay? So um, we can do this using the can-do statements, right, that we just looked at before. And um, what's nice about this particular rubric that I just pulled up, and this is taken from the Adair Hot Glisson and Troyan book called Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment. So what's nice about this rubric is that it's already aligned to the actual performance indicators. Okay, so you can see here um, criteria for interpretive tasks would include word recognition, main idea detection, and supporting detail detection. And then you have exceeds expectations, meets expectations, either with strong or minimal comprehension, and then does not meet expectations. Okay, so we're gonna be, in the remaining time, we just have a, a few minutes left. I wanna save about five minutes at least for question and answers um, that we're gonna see how we can use this. Okay, so this is just an example of an authentic video that is all about um, Barcelona and this idea of the super manzana, which is like a super block um, this video that I'm showing you is, it just has music in the background and you can see just a little bit of text. So it would be appropriate um, for your intermediate learners, which is what we're gonna target with this. Okay, so after they've seen and they've unpacked that uh, video a little bit with some previewing or pre-reading rather activities, what you see here is, uh, a written informational text in the same um, topic, right? So it's talking about Barcelona and the first super manzana that they created um, in Barcelona to address this problem of uh, contamination and pollution in the city. Okay, so students are reading this. And um, so, one of our initial questions, one of the questions that I asked you to think about was how are you going to assess their interpretation ability or their interpretive ability rather? And um, so I would definitely point you to this resource, which again comes from the Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment book. Um, this is an interpretive task template, right? So for this task, you as the instructor are selecting content words from the actual article and you're translating them into English and then your students are um, going to go back to the actual text and find the words in Spanish that they believe correspond or expresses the meaning of each of those words. So let me give you an example. I've gone to the text itself and I have pulled out 10 content words, I've translated them into English. And now my students, see here's the, uh, what they have to do. They're finding an article um, in the target language that expresses the meaning of these words, right? So this is my example student. He got transportacion, he wasn't sure about those three, he got sustentabilidad, um, right? He didn't get all of them. So when I'm going back to my interpretive rubric, I'm gonna say, how am I gonna assess his word recognition ability? Well, I'm gonna say he identifies half of the keywords, right? So this rubric is already created for you. You can design your tasks using this template, the interpretive task template. Um, and here's another task, right? So this one's really e relatively easy. You're just asking your students, using information from the article, provide the main idea of the article. They can write it in English. Okay, so my student, my example student said, the main idea is that Barcelona has had a lot of pollution because of the extensive traffic in the city. Okay, so using the template and now the interpretive rubric, how am I going to assess him on main idea detection? Right, the second criteria over there. Well, I'm thinking he identified some part of the main idea of the text 
but he didn't really get into, for example, the idea of the super manzana um, and the nitty gritty, um, which was a, a, a big part of the main idea. Right, so I, I said he identifies some of the main idea, but not all of it. Okay, and then the third type of test, the th third and final, which is the most complex, is the interpretive, uh, the supporting details. Okay, so how do we set up this type of task? We have to first look inside the article for facts or details, and we have to write them in English, right? For example, this first one here, percentage of Barcelona cyclists in 2011. So students, again, have to go back to the article. They have to find where in the article that appeared. They have to list the the letter or, or mark the actual text mark it up with the letter a right which was the letter of the detail back here and then they have to write step three here write the information that's given in the article uh, to answer that detail so the percentage of cyclists in 2011 they found it it's actually 1.5 percent okay so um, which you can see here in the in the letter A. Okay, so I think we're I'm gonna uh, just skim through these other slides because it's the same idea. So they're seeking in the text um, details. They're finding where those details occur. They're marking up the text, and then they're answering. In this case, my student didn't get the the third detail. Right, he wasn't sure about two means of transport that the plan will increase. He got the fourth detail, I believe. Let's see. Yes, he got the fourth detail, the name of the neighborhood where the intervention will occur. And he also got, this one's interesting. So the detail was the number of city blocks impacted by the plan, which was, you can see it's in, the actual text, nine blocks, right? So he marked that with E, but I would argue that he could also get credit for it if he circled the um, multimodal image, which you can also see those nine blocks. Okay, so with that, I will um, probably assess my student here. He identifies the majority of supporting details in the text and provides information from the text to explain some of these details. All right, so thank you very much for listening and your participation. And I am going to turn it over. It looks like we have a few minutes for questions. Yes, we do. Thank you very much, Jesse. We really appreciate your time and sharing with us and for those of you who are participants, you will see a brief survey come through in the chat. If you can please go ahead and take that survey so we can get some feedback on the presentation. So we might have time for one quick question. It was one of the first ones that came up. As educators, it's easy for us to ask students basic comprehension questions and assess what they're understanding using a basic question. But how can educators really assess our students' ability to read in between the lines, which is related to intercultural competence? This is a really, really good question, and I'm glad you brought it up. So what I was showing with, I'm just going to jump back a couple slides here. Um, I actually just gave you part of this rubric, right? So the literal comprehension, which you can see up there in the title, is just one piece of the puzzle. And you're absolutely right, whoever asked this question, is that we want our students to be able to read between the lines, um, which is the, I believe they call it the, the figurative or the interpretive comprehension, which is the uh, remainder of this rubric, actually the majority of this rubric, I've just shown you a third of it. Uh, I encourage you to really seek out this resource and I'll pull it up again here. It's um, Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment 
Um, this book has not only the template that we used here at the end to create the tasks, it also has um, the rubrics, not just for interpretive assessments, but also for interpersonal and presentational assessments. So I would encourage you to go and, and find that rubric and, and you're, you're going to be able to use this same um, process that we used for the literal comprehension, but you're going to be able to use it for the figurative comprehension. And, and um, what's nice about the rubric is that you can just use that rubric and you can also use the template that's provided in the Implementing Integrated Performance Assessment book to create those types of tasks. Fantastic, really good, thank you. And we'll definitely be seeking out that rubric for sure. Maybe time for one more very quick question. Um, what advice do you have for teachers whose students don't share the same L1 language whenever they're create, when you're creating those interpretive tasks for the students to complete? So say, for example, you have a class where maybe you have a lot of um, heritage and native Spanish speakers, and then maybe some native English speakers where they might not have that common target with the L1 language of English, how would you suggest going about designing some tasks for those students? Well, this is actually a very common situation. I would say it's more common than not in, um, especially in the context of Spanish. We have mixtures of native heritage and second language speakers in our classes. Um, I'm not sure that that would necessarily change the, the types of tasks that I would do. I think you could still use the, the same um, task models that are included in the in implementing IPA book. But if you do have, um, for example, a student who is literate in Spanish, um, I would definitely welcome them to write down the details in Spanish. Excellent. Thank you very much. It was great talking with you, Jesse. And again, thank you for taking the time to share with us this afternoon, evening, and thank you for coming out. No, thank you very much for having me.